welcome to burn cast in the fall it's so great that we're having some pretty weather and um and since it's the fall i think it's a perfect time to talk about fevers in the burn patient um one of the things that i have found really interesting about our our burn patients that are toddlers is that I feel like all of them have rhinoentero before they get burned, and they may even have a fever before they get burned. But um, so today I'd like to discuss um, fevers in burn patients and what to do, why it's normal, and um, when it's not normal. So um, first, let's talk about what a fever is. So um, what's a fever? What temperature-wise is a fever? Yeah. We, I, we generally say anything greater than like 100.4 is a fever, but we really count anything over 101.5. Um, when, and I'm talking about when I'm talking to parents, um, when we're in the outpatient world, but what we're looking for when it's Celsius is anything over 39. Over 39. Mm -hmm. So if we have any patient, we'll, we'll start with any patient, not burn patients, because our burn patients are special. So if you have a kiddo that um, is in the hospital with like um, any, for any reason, mm -hmm. and their fever or their temperature is 38, would that be considered a fever? I think it depends on who you talk to. In oncology, yes. In burns, it's like low grade. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, I think people consider 38 where your like cutoff is for having a fever or like where you start to have a fever. And then it's the severity of it after that. So if a, if a temperature is 38 or greater, would you give like Tylenol and Motrin or like Tylenol or Motrin? Absolutely. Okay. And um, what's the age uh, breakdown for uh, Motrin? When do we not give Motrin? Less than six months. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Tylenol for everyone, unless they're allergic and mm -hmm. Motrin for everyone, unless there's a contraindication, unless they are under six months old. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking... I know we were talking about all patients, but if we're talking specifically about burn patients, we put all of our inpatient burn patients generally, generally, I'm, that's a, you know, I don't, I don't always take all and very like, but almost every single patient who's an inpatient burn gets around the clock Tylenol and Motrin while they're here. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. It's in our order set to, to start with around the clock Tylenol and Motrin. And then we, we make it PRN if they're able to tolerate it. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about, now that we've like decided what a fever is and how do we normally treat it, um, let's talk about burn patients. So burn patients and fevers. Uh, Liz, can you just give us like a, a, a kind of a little bit of an overview of like are fevers normal for burn patients? Are they abnormal? Um, are we more concerned if you have rhinoentero and a burn and a fever? You know, a, a good synopsis. Absolutely. Well, if you refer to the burn fever guideline, it's actually called the burn fever or slash suspected infection guideline. It's on the internet. Um, it actually break down, breaks down these definitions nicely. For a burn patient, we consider a fever a core, of a core, with a core temperature of 39 or greater. Um, so with burn injuries, the body is working really hard to heal itself. So you'll know um, that uh, I'll have you know that these patients are um, tachycardic, they're more, their heart rates are more elevated, they're more tachypnic, and their temperature actually kind of resets. So we have a higher fever threshold for these burn patients who become what we call hypermetabolic. So again, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, um, and associated higher temperature. So with that being said, we become concerned when there is a core temperature of 39 degrees Celsius or greater twice. Um, when that occurs, we, uh, we ask our providers to launch what we call the burn fever order set. Um, and that is nice because it's a nice guide as to what the workup needs to be. It used to be that when a burn patient had a fever, we would wait um, uh, an unspecified amount of time. Sometimes it was a couple of days and then do a full, you know, septic workup. Um, but that's really changed, um, with the work that's come out of, um, a collaboration with the infectious disease department, critical care and trauma burn. So when you say 
uh, fever in a burn patient is 39 or above. And we start to do that like infection workup if they have a fever of 39 or above twice. Right. Is that twice during admission, twice in 24 hours, twice in 12 hours? Just just twice. And you'll probably see, especially if the kid is spiking a temp despite Tylenol no turn around the clock, it's probably going to happen in a pretty close interval. So a couple so of if, hours or several hours. What if the kid for some reason wasn't ordered the Tylenol or Motrin around the clock and spikes a fever of 39 twice? Do you then just put them on Tylenol or Motrin around the clock and then see if they do it again or? I would launch I would, that. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I would hope that if you had a patient who had a fever of 39 once, you would buy yourself Tylenol or Motrin and then we'd see if we get the second one. Um, but I would go ahead and launch it. I, I don't know if Liz would agree with that statement. I would, I would. And when the when this order set is launched, um, it's important to note that the only things automatically checked are vital signs Q4 hours, um, as well as a CVC. So the provider has um, the can, can choose to order a CVC. Um, and then a hospitalist consult. We can talk about that again later. And then this order set has the provider look through symptoms. It, re, it spells out symptoms and when that appropriate test should be ordered. For instance, if the patient is experiencing dysuria, then a urine and urinalysis and a urine culture should be should be ordered. If the patient has evidence of you know a runny nose and congestion, we would go with a respiratory viral panel. So some patients conceivably may have none of those symptoms, and so just a CBC and Q4 vital signs is maybe you know where a good place to start. So an elevated temperature in burn patients is normal. Yes, and it's expected. So if you have a patient that has a temp of 38, we don't need to freak out and um, be like, we need to order blood cultures. We need to get a CBC. We need to do all the things. So 38 is normal. We start worrying when a fever is 39 and have that twice. Correct. Okay. I will say cool. if a kid, can I say, um, if a kid is 38 and not tolerating it well, like not drinking well and not doing a thing, then that may be something that you may be a little bit concerned about. Um, like if they're 38, seven multiple times and they're, you want to also look at the rest of the clinical picture. So it's also, you know, if the, if the patient's ill appearing or just doesn't look right. And, you know, that's that, you know, that clinical acumen that, you know, all of our nursing staff has of like, you know, I know the temp's only 38, six, but they just don't look right. Like, I think we might need right. to do something more. So, so say we have um, a nurse on um, five East and they're taking care of a patient and the temp is like 38, five and um, it goes down with Tylenol and Motrin, but they just don't look right. And they call a resident and they, you know, they say, I'm worried for X, Y, and Z, their urine outputs down. They aren't eating well. We don't have an NG tube because the burn is only like 4% and they were eating. And, um, and the resident says, that's fine. Burn fevers are normal. We're, we're expecting this, but the nurse is concerned. What, what should they do and what should they say? I think one of the things is that, you know, we're, we don't only just look at the number. Obviously, when it comes to burn injuries where you can have this hypermetabolic state, so patients can be affected by that. Um, but I think if you're having an issue with, you would, you would reiterate your concern, your symptoms, and, and really spell it out. Like, I'm worried because the urine output is this, because the heart rate has been sustained at this, because the patient has, you know, hasn't taken any POs or they're on fluids or they're not on fluids. So yeah, I, I, would I, I would be concerned about so like really stating what your concerns are. And then if you feel like you're not getting the response that you want, I would go um, to the fellow or if you need to, and we're talking about five East and a burn patient. So if, you know, I'm talking specifically of this chain of command, but if you need to, you can always go to the burn surgeon if you, as well. Absolutely. Okay. And I think the, the phrase, I need you to come assess the patient is incredibly important to say. Um, again, the two of you can work together as the bedside provider, as the provider to, to determine what is going on, what is the best care for the patient. Um, and you know, that's, that's tricky. 
because if you have a kid that um, has a burn, they obviously are going to have some pain. They're in this hypermetabolic state that you're saying. They are tachycardic. They are tachypnic. They have a fever. All of those things just don't sit well with anybody. Mm -hmm. But knowing that it's more normal for a burn patient, I think is really helpful. So and like knowing those parameters of when to be concerned and what is normal and what isn't, I think is, um, I think it's really helpful. And um, I think that our, our Five East um, staff is like very used to taking care of burn patients with fevers. But then let's talk about a burn patient with a fever in, um, in the PICU, because, you know, everybody's going to be on top of everything, be like, all right, let's order everything. Let's get lines. Maybe we need a tube. <laughs> like, um, so I think just um, like that overall understanding of we expect an elevated temperature, because I don't know if I really want to call it a fever mm -hmm. in a burn patient. We expect an elevated temperature, but we really don't need to start sounding the alarm until it's 39 and um, like sustained. So and sustained meaning a twice. Um, when we're talking about like just Tylenol and Motrin, um, and what would make you as a provider order IV Tylenol instead of um, PO Tylenol? I would do that if a patient is not tolerating any enteral intake. So if the patient no, no, is on no, NG feeds, um, you can probably give Tylenol through the NG tube. And if a patient is not tolerating that, then I would do IV. Okay. And um, if a, if a child is too young to um, have Motrin, so let's talk, we'll say like a four month old that had like a, like a spill scald from like a hot bottle or something and um, Tylenol isn't cutting it is, are there any other options? No, okay. I didn't think there was. Yeah, no. I just want to make yeah. sure. I, mean, I don't get this. No, <laughs> yeah, I don't think there is so. either. No medication. I mean, you could try some cooling measures. You know, just you know. Yeah, you may absorbing a little bit, but I think just in your time and all. Yeah. yeah, keep the blankets off. I think that that's just also a hard yeah. thing I mean, to remember because we want to snuggle up our babies. Right. But if well, they I'm, have an elevated temp, you might want to like not snuggle them up as much. I know, but can you, you know, when you have a fever and you're hot, but you're cold, but you're hot, yes. but you're cold. So you want blankets, but you're hot and you have a fever and you're cold. So I, I also don't like to make patients like exceedingly uncomfortable right. in order to like get a good number. Like if a patient is going to be 39 uncovered with some cool packs or 39 three with oh. like a blanket and more comfortable like just put the blanket on them right okay. like you're giving everything you can is at least how I feel I about it like fine. I don't have to chase a but perfect I, number I if the meds aren't going to do it um, okay Good I, to know. you want to keep them comfortable within like while trying to like not over heat them okay. I guess so right don't go crazy is don't go crazy saying. one way or the other yeah, yeah. we don't not, have to like put ice packs on their extremities or anything like don't like like we don't want to get yeah. to chase a number yeah and I feel like personally I feel like ice packs um on kids is um mean and it just it it's just they just get so cold and then they start to shiver and then that we increases their metabolic, we and metabolic demand. Right. exactly so there's there's plenty of I'm I'm trying to say that you know we if you're stuck with Tylenol or, or, or Tylenol or Motrin isn't cutting it, then sometimes that's, that's the best you're going to get. And you don't want to make it worse by, you know, too many blankets, but, or heat packs or anything, but yeah. you just got to kind of do your best. So a blanket is fine. Heat packs are not. <laughs> Taking yeah. off the blanket is okay, but cold packs are not. So right. don't Somewhere go in the middle. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Liz, what do you see as our biggest problem with um, burn fevers? Like, what do you see? Um, and for everybody in our audience, um, just to remind everybody that um, Liz is our, our PI coordinator for burn and trauma. So she looks at like all of the kind of like all of the issues that we have with with our patients and making sure that we provide the best care that we can and the same care every time for all of our patients. What do you see, Liz, as like one of our biggest struggles with burn fever? Well, I, you know, I think we, we've already brought it to everyone's attention that the, the temperature should be elevated. You know, it's a higher threshold to consider a fever. But 
keep in mind, these kids are high risk. Anyone in the hospital is high risk. Anyone with a burn is high risk. And when you have a, a patient with a burn injury in the hospital, that's a high risk patient. So I just, I want folks to remember that, that yes, there is a, a, a physiologic reason to have an elevated temperature. We just want to make sure we're not missing thing, anything. And which is really the beauty of this order set where we can go through line by line. Is this patient exhibiting signs of sepsis? If, if yes, then we have automatic, you know, antibiotic orders and bolus orders, and you can get a, a BMP before starting antibiotics. Um, again, sometimes it is just normal, you know, childhood infection. Sometimes it is rhinoenterovirus. Um, but we also need to think about looking at the wound too, um, because sometimes a really deep burn can be that fever source. Um, so it's really just looking at big clinical picture, you know, make, making sure you're compliant with vital signs and Q scores escalating when appropriate, uh, but kind of just always searching for, for what it could be. Um, as I mentioned, there's also the option for a hospitalist consult. That way you have a pediatrician coming to the bedside who's looking at ears and the throat, potentially other sources. And again, just remember that these, these burns really immunocompromised kids. At home, they might be able to mount a good, you know, healthy response to rhino enterovirus, but here they're exhausted, their bodies are already fighting, so it can make them pretty sick. Yeah, I like to, I agree with what you said earlier, Cindy, that it seems like every all these kids have rhino entero, right? Um and I, I think it's a prerequisite to have a burn in a toddler. Yeah, I think rhino it's, entero, you're getting a burn. Yeah. I think it's just that toddlers have rhino entero and the burn kids don't tolerate it as well, right? Or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. soup du jour, right? Maybe it's RSV, maybe it's rhino entero, maybe it's coronavirus, maybe it's mm -hmm. human metanumovirus, like whatever oh, yeah. it is, right? All like the it things. Could be any of them. Mm -hmm. Um, but toddlers have viruses and the burn patients don't tolerate it as well. So you see it more, I think, um, in our burn patients. Absolutely. That makes sense. And again, we just want to make sure that we're assessing the wound as well to make sure it doesn't look infected. It could be deeper. The kid, the kid is not eating and not keeping up with those metabolic needs, then you know, that's going to kind of contribute to that hyper metabolic cycle as well. So, right. You can't write off that that's the only source because plenty of times it's a patient who has a very deep burn that needs yeah. to be evaluated and needs further treatment mm -hmm. and they have rhino entero or they have rhino entero and they have a UTI or something like that. So you, you, you know, we're always suspicious. Um, what would you, um, say is the biggest culprit of um like a true infection in a burn patient so something um other than like a normal burn response that it that will cause a fever so you know you do that work up like what what would you say is the biggest cause or is that I, an unfair question no 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 i think i think you just you have to kind of like look at at burns in general. So you have a, you know, you have a lapse in skin integrity. So staff is probably the most common agent that we see. Okay. Um, but then you can, you can also see, you know, with this deep escar and a full thickness burn and a really deep burn, you can see some, some tissue necrosis and that's kind of opening the skin up for, for other bacterial culprits. Um, but in this burn fever guideline, it actually will talk um, the provider through how to assess for a burn wound infection. It's, it's not the most common thing that is seen. Normally it's not the burn that's infected, but again, it can happen, especially if the kid's already immunocompromised. So then and other than a fever and tachycardia and tachypnea, what are signs that um, bedside staff should be on the lookout for, for a potential infection? What are the other signs and symptoms um, we should be looking for? For any type of infection, or are you specifically asking about a burn infection? Any infection, any infection. in a burn patient. In a burn patient. I think um, it could be depending on what the source is. So like we're, we've talked about that the viral URI is a, really, is a really common one, but I would also say that that's not our most severe one. So uh, um, we almost always, and I'm saying almost always because I'm not very, I'm not very keen on making 100% blanket statements, but you want to evaluate the burn itself. So when you can't just say, oh, they have a runny nose, that's the problem. Um, they have a virus, that's the problem. You also need to take down the bandage and look at the burn and see if the burn has either converted from deep partial to full thickness or has erythema around it, purulent drainage. Those would be things that would lead me to um, like more of a cellulitic or a burn infection. Um, but 
the other patient that is really high risk for getting infections would be our ICU patients who are intubated, have a Foley. Um, so you may see cloudy urine. You might see that their ventilator settings are growing up. Those are kind of some symptoms of our other infections. And this is all that Liz is talking about when it says um, it, the, the burn fever protocol marches you down some of these symptoms to kind of look for what you're going to work up. And so Did that answer um, your question. Yeah, no, that absolutely answers my question. So, you know, you have a patient with an elevated temperature, maybe it's starting to head towards 39. So we're looking for any type of cause. So like, do the dressing smell? Is there drainage from the dressing? You know, does the kid have a runny nose? Are they tugging at their ears? Mm -hmm. Do they have dysuria? Do they, you know, all, all, all of the things. Mm -hmm. So all it's really things. just those like good, um, like a really good detailed assessment. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And, and that is something that we heavily rely on nursing to pick up on, but also if there's like, if a patient is exhibiting signs of, of, of fevers or, or being sick, then having the providers come to the bedside and saying, I really want you to come examine this patient because it's, it's the team that really helps help make these diagnosis and, and, and figure out what's going on. Okay. Liz, anything to add for that, for, like if you're taking care of a burn patient, like things to be on the lookout for, or like, what do you, what's the number one thing that you see missed? Um, I think honestly, if you look at, at burn care globally, it's taking a look at the wound, mm -hmm. you know, a kiddo bounces back. Funny. The, that, they, that seems like that, that is upsetting and crazy to me. That it's like, know? You but have I, an open I, thing. You have an open lesion in the skin and yeah, yeah, I an think, infection. Like, well, I, well, I, I, in, here's the context though. If you see, you know, a toddler in, you know, a burn dressing, that's most of the torso, they're in that burn shirt. It looks perfect. It would be really hard to convince yourself. You have to take that off, uh, um, especially if you're not that comfortable with it. But again, it's something that really has to be done. I don't think it's appropriate if a kid, you know, comes back with high fevers um, to not look at the, to not look at the wound. Now, is that something that you would want bedside nursing to do, or would you want a provider at the bedside? I would want a provider to get it together. It. But uh, again, just to kind of make sure, you know, all of our boxes are checked and that we do a good head to toe on the kiddo look at the wounds so I think that's probably the most okay so because sometimes that wound needs to go into a different treatment yeah and that's that's a decision that and an order that the provider can place in order or a decision they can make to change the treatment absolutely it might need to go into an everyday dressing it might need to go to the, the child may need to go to the operating room to have some of that of that skin really you know um really dealt with so um so we're not asking our bedside provider, we're not asking our bedside nurses to take down dressings. We're asking them to say, hey, Anne, can you come to the bedside? And I think we should take, I think we should look at this wound together. So yeah. um, I think that that's probably like words that um, we can give our staff to use of like, hey, I'm concerned for X, Y, and Z. Maybe we should look at this together. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I feel like Anne and Joe and um, Catherine would probably, if they heard that from a bedside nurse, they would be like, oh, wow, I'm on my way. Yeah. Even With if they my supplies and my extra strong medications. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a, a good delineation because I don't think that we want people to just start taking down dressings to, I don't think anybody would, but I think it's right. always good to know that. And you need to have somebody that has Turner capture with you. So if there is a change mm -hmm. in the wound bed, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that it's documented and, um, that way we can show even um, like the burn attendings of like, hey, this burn converted, it looks different. That's why we changed, you know, this dressing to that dressing. Yep. Okay. Um, Liz, earlier, so you you keep on like mentioning this, um, the burn um, fever like order set. Mm -hmm. So that is something that, um, that it's like provider view only. So nursing can't really see that whole order set on the back end. Is that correct? Um, I think they can see if an order it well certainly if the order is selected, right? Um, but I think if there are any questions, I would certainly it completely mimics the burn fever guidelines. So honestly, it's probably not a bad idea just to just print that out, know it exists, and then even maybe just go through it with the provider too if there are any questions. Can I share my screen? Yeah, um, you can. Is that Absolutely. okay for the internet? Yeah. Okay, let me make sure that I share the right screen. Say, okay. like, this is a great way for people to um, know how to access a burn mm -hmm. fever guideline. 
So where mm-hmm. are you going? And could you talk us? Yes, I will. As just soon as I just want to make sure I don't listening. open the patient chart instead. So I'm ignoring Fair. you for a second. Okay. Can you see my intranet here? Yes. So I typed in burn fever. Okay. And there's the trauma and burn manual, which is, is outdated. We, but um, this is our surgery fever burn. Let's check that first. And we'll work through it together because there's another place that I want to show you. So this is our mm-hmm. burn fever protocol. And it goes through it. Testing, burn fever, suspected infection, workup plan, testing, obtain a CBC, concern for urinary tract infection, obtain these, concern for viral upper respiratory tract infection, obtain these, obtain these, sepsis, hospital. So it, it really marches through this. It has age-based vital signs, um, impaired treatment. So if we're starting a patient, we're worried somebody has a UTI, um, we, depending on what the UA shows, then we determine, it says even what your antimicrobial coverage is going to be. Concern for wound infection, local wound infection, if we have cellulitis and if we need to, we consider these, which we consider in consultation with the burn surgeon, the attending. And then this is when we're narrowing and discontinuing um, antimicrobials. And then, oh, that's narrowing and discontinuing. This, yeah. is the, this is the visual. This is your visual. <laughs> so here you are. So this is a source that you can look on the internet. Can I also just point something out real quick? Yes. Not only is this for a temperature greater than 39, but you also have to be highly concerned if a patient has a very low temperature. So I think it's Mm -hmm. outlined in Mm -hmm. here, I think less than 35.5. Yes, it's here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's a really good, important um, point to make, Liz, is that hypothermia is not a good sign either. So we really want our patients to be 35. normothermic and, mm-hmm. but we allow for a little bit of an elevated temp. It's just like the far ends of the spectrum, like over 39 and under yeah. 35.2. So 35.2? Uh, five, 35.5. 35.5. Oh, wow. Siri found something on the web about burn fevers. How lovely. <laughs> so if you go back to here, you can also see this is is um the order set you can can you um see. what did you oh, um click on just so say, i went to burn surgery fever or sus- suspected infection plan okay and it brought me to this and this is actually what goes into Cerner to make the order set so you cannot see the order set like you can't you might nurses might not be able to pull up the order set in Cerner and power tr- in um power chart but you can pull this up and you can see that this what may be a, coming. This is coming because it has an X next to it and they might choose anything else, but it says foul smelling, cloudy urine, et cetera. Okay. Choose these. Well, so you can great. see it what walks is available. Everything, everybody through everything. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that, that I just easy. typed in burn fever under the internet. And those are after the first one, the next two things that showed up. Perfect. Surgery fever burn and burn surgery fever or suspected infection plan. Yeah, That's great. Well, thank you. That was, um, that's very helpful. And it's always good to like um, have a resource that people can reference if needed. And all of those things are easily printed. So if mm-hmm. you are like working with maybe a newer resident who, um, you know, hasn't seen that before, you can say like, Hey, we have this resource, mm-hmm. like we don't need to go crazy, but, or we do need to do X, Y, and Z because Print we have it out and put it on the chart and give it yep. to people. Yep. All right. So um, I think that we have Um, I think burn fevers are something that is confusing. And I think it was definitely worth like having a a, a burn cast about. Um, So Anne, what is the number one thing you want um, anybody who watches this to remember about burn fevers? Like what's your, what's your take home? Hmm. Okay. What's my take home? I know I should anticipate this because I feel you ask me every time, but um, (laughs) I think my take home is that we have a team to work together and everybody brings something to the table. So if the, if the parents feel like the patient is a little bit punky or acting off, if the nurse is, you know, concerned about um, a fever to 39 a couple of times and the, they're not getting the response from the resident, if the resident or NP or whomever is, I, I really think that everybody has something to add to making sure that we're doing the best we can to work up these patients um, and to, to know that we should all feel empowered to work together. I like that. Is that okay? Yeah, I like that. I love, I like, you know, anything, any take home that involves the word team, it's like that, I, I love that. 
I don't want people to feel like, and, and I think oftentimes that these burn casts are, are mostly for our nursing staff and, and they seem to enjoy them. But, and so I want nurses to feel like I really do value bedside nursing experience because they're the ones who are there throughout the day a lot more than other people. So I think they pick up on things oftentimes before the rest of the team does. Yeah, those so subtle, really, the subtle differences. Subtle differences. And, and it can be just a little like gestalt thing. Um, I really value that, but I don't want people nursing to feel that they're the only one on the team who has to pick up on these things. So I want everybody to realize that the providers and the rest of the team also is here and we need to work together. I should have ended with you. That was great. <laughs> All right, Liz, I couldn't come up with one at first. I love that. No, I think that. <laughs> just you know, just as I said before, just heightened awareness. Again, just remember that this is this is an injury like no other injury out there. Um, remember, these kids are high risk, and again, um, physiologic changes are definitely evident with this type of injury. But remember, as if you have an admitted burn in the hospital, in the hospital, um, just keep a real close eye on. All right. Can I say something, Liz? What is our numbers? Our numbers are like out of our thousands of burn visits per year, 500 or 1,000 per year, it's usually 2% that are in the hospital. Yeah, very few. Most of this care is in the outpatient setting. Um, and in fact, the, the suspected infection order set works for the outpatient setting too. Everything mm -hmm. that you need is in there, whether you're seeing them in clinic or treating them you know, um, on Five East. Um, but yeah, it's very, very few. So just kind of just remember that if they are in the hospital, they're sick. Uh, they are sick. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause it takes a lot to be admitted to the hospital right. with a burn. Yep. And we try to, we try to discharge patients as soon as it's safe. Um, but we try to, we really, this is definitely a patient, um, population. We try not to keep in the hospital. And then, um, finally my thing, um, that the take home is, is that a burn patient with a fever of 38 isn't really a fever. We aren't really, really concerned until it hits 39 or the clinical picture suggests like some, like if the patient is ill appearing or toxic appearing that it, even if they had a, did not have a temperature at all, if a patient's ill appearing, get somebody else involved and have another member of the team, take a look at the patient. It's always worth another look. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining Thanks, us Cindy. today. And um, we will discuss um after this, what we're going to talk about next. I have a couple ideas after this. So oh, we'll see. yeah, I just was like, Ooh, I think I have something. So stay tuned. <laughs>